from the Colleges of Medicine of South Africa. We are really, really looking forward um, to his teachings because uh, he embeds laughter such that, you know, you never get bored. And by the time he says he's done, you're like, yo, how can he be so done so quickly? Because we love those daily jokes. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Sad, let me not spoil the party and uh, head over today's session to yourself. Welcome, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Mewela, for those beautiful, warm words of welcome. And good evening, everybody. Uh, Dr. Mewela, can you see my slides and hear my voice? Yes, everything is clear. Thank you. I just want to say how fresh Dr. Mewela looks after his power nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good evening, everybody. Still Thanks recovering. Still recovering. I hear you snore quite a, quite a lot. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us, <clears throat> for taking the time to talk about jaundice, and I uh, hope you and your family are well, wherever you are in the country, even outside the country, hope you are doing well. <clears throat> it's always good to start with an, a note of gratitude, just to say thank you, uh, like the Bible says, give thanks at all times, this is God's will for you. So it's good for us to always have an attitude of gratitude. Uh, to Dr. Mawela and the Clinical Care Platform, you are doing an incredible job. And I show, I'm, I'm sure I, I speak for everybody here uh, when we say thank you so much. We really benefit from the service that you offer. Keep on keeping on. Um, thank you so much. And of course, a big thank you to everybody who's joined us this evening. This would not be possible had it not been for you as well. <clears throat> right. Disclaimer to start off. I am not a surgeon. I am a physician, right? So uh, jaundice is kind of one of those topics where the physicians and the surgeons kind of butt heads a little bit um, because the surgeon would say that there are three causes of jaundice uh, in a particular sequence, stones, worms, and tumors. The physician would say there are 20 causes of jaundice in no particular order. <laughs> but, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship, you know? Surgeons need physicians, physicians need surgeons. We work together harmoniously. Um, so um, just a quick uh, introduction to this series for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Um, after watching each session, the learner should be able to list the common and dangerous diagnoses they can potentially cause each symptom and thereafter develop a very basic diagnostic plan for an individual patient with a symptom which is balanced between being both rapid, low risk, and cost effective. Now, the primary audience for these sessions is anybody, right? whether you're a medical student, nursing staff, interns, medical officers, registrars, even if you're a seasoned consultant in the wards, I have something to offer you. And the video format is as follows. We're gonna first up kick off with a couple of relevant terms and definitions and followed by a discussion of the diagnostic framework, which is basically a list of diagnoses which can explain the presence of a specific symptom. And today we're talking about jaundice, physical exam finding or diagnostic test abnormality organized into discrete categories. Now, we've been through chest pain before, um, and most commonly diagnostic frameworks are based on organ system. Example, the causes of chest pain, which we can see here. However, for other systems, alternative organizational schemes might be more appropriate, such as those based on pathophysiological mechanism, which worked well when we spoke about lower extremity edema as depicted. Sometimes you might even want to use anatomical region, which works very well when we spoke about abdominal pain. Now, diagnostic frameworks help us to remember diagnoses which we should consider in a patient which may or may not eventually make their way into our differential diagnosis. As a general rule, diagnostic frameworks should be relatively comprehensive, but for the purposes of this particular series, I'm going to keep them limited to including only those diagnoses which are, number one, either common in practice, number two, commonly tested, or number three, particularly dangerous if you miss it. After presenting the diagnostic framework for each symptom, we will then move into a diagnostic algorithm. This algorithm will be the practical approach to making the correct diagnosis in a patient who presents with that particular symptom. After that will come some clinical pearls regarding diagnostic strategy and investigation. And last up, we're going to give you a nice little doggy bag of takeaway points. So unlike many other similar resources you may encounter on the web, 
or even in the library, the approaches I present here will represent how physicians think about these problems in real life with real patients. These approaches may be informed by textbooks, clinical practice guidelines, and literature, but they also incorporate my own personal experience and observations as a practicing physician in the state. As they are presented at the level of a healthcare professional in training, these algorithms will cover most, but not every conceivable situation. So we're not going to mention particularly esoteric diseases, and if a certain diagnostic test is really performed in practice, we're not going to talk about it, irrespective of how classic it may be or its historical importance. Our goal here is to be accurate, practical, and concise. <clears throat> so that was a big mouthful for the introduction. Um, so Dr. Mawela, we are Zooming. We've covered 14, 14 lectures in the series thus far. We're actually entering the second half of the screen. So today is our 15th approach, which means that we are 45% the way there to having the brain of a physician, which is amazing, right? And of course, I love my dad jokes. So speaking of which, here's one for you. Eyes make dedicated teachers because they only have one pupil. <laughs> right, guys, clinical case to get us started. 41-year-old <clears throat> woman comes to your clinic with a week of jaundice. Oh, man. She notes pruritus, um, she notes icterus, and dark urine. So she denies fever, abdominal pain, or weight loss, and very important exclusions. The examination is unremarkable except for yellowish discoloration of the skin. Total bilirubin rubin, 60 micromol per liter. And direct bili is 52. It looks like a direct or a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. The AST is 84, which is up. ART is also 92, which is raised. Arcfos is a whopping 662. CT scan of the abdomen is otherwise unremarkable. Right upper quadrant ultrasound shows a beautiful normal gallbladder. Does not visualize the common bile duct. Hybo. What is the next appropriate management step? Is it A? Antibiotics and observation, is it B, endoscopic retrograde angiopancreatography, which is ARCP? Is it C, serology for hepatitis, D, upper scope, or E, serology for anti-mitochondrial antibodies? Hmm. Well, hopefully by the end of the session, you will be able to answer this question confidently. All right, what is jaundice? Jaundice actually comes from a French word called Jean, not Jean-Claude Van Damme, this Jean, <laughs> which means yellow. This is a yellowish discoloration of the skin, sclera, and mucosa caused by elevation in serum bilirubin, which, as you remember, is the yellow-orange bile pigment. Now, bilirubin is formed as a breakdown product of heme rings, usually from metabolized hemoglobin as a result of either physiological or pathophysiological destruction of red blood cells. All right. Now, the location in the body where jaundice is first noticed is in the eyes. Just like the words of Roxette, look into your eyes. Actually, look into your heart or something like that, which is called scleral icterus. Mm. Now, this can usually be observed once the psyllium bilirubin rises above 40 millimol per liter. Now, the point at which jaundice can be observed more generally depends upon the patient's skin tone and the ambient light. So ideally, you want to be in natural light not in artificial light, okay? Now, as you know, these sessions are meant to focus on clinically relevant information, but a brief review of the biochemistry of bilirubin will be foundational to understanding both the diagnostic framework of jaundice as well as its workup. So as mentioned, the first step uh, in the development of bilirubin is the destruction of red blood cells. This process is called hemolysis, which then releases hemoglobin and the heme groups at the center. Heme is first metabolized into something we call biliverdin, and from biliverdin into unconjugated bilirubin. Now, these steps usually occur within the macrophages of the reticular and ethereal system. Unconjugated bilirubin is transported to the liver or the blood, some of which is non covalently bound to albumin. Right? Now, once in the liver, it undergoes a process called conjugation in which two molecules of glucuronic acid are covalently bound to it. This is a very significant step because conjugated bilirubin is much more water-soluble than is unconjugated bilirubin. So once conjugated, bilirubin is then excreted into the bile via the hepatic duct, 
which eventually drain into the duodenum via the common bile route. Unconjugated rubin is often called uh, indirect bilirubin. Conjugated bilirubin is called direct bilirubin. Now, these are not strictly synonyms, since the direct bilirubin includes both the conjugated bilirubin as well as unconjugated bilirubin that is bound to albumin. However, they are quantitatively close enough to be used interchangeably for routine clinical purposes. Okay, and that's the point that we just said, right? Unconjugated and indirect bilirubin and conjugated and direct bilirubin are not strictly synonyms. Okay, now, the simplest conceptual framework for jaundice puts etiologies into either one of three categories based on where in the biochemical process the problem lies. For example, pathology can be pre-hepatic, meaning that hemolysis, uh, in which there is an increased production of bilirubin, is a predominant feature. Pathology can also be intrahepatic, almost always from intrinsic liver disease, or post-hepatic, which is almost always from biliary obstruction. Now, in these latter two categories, that's intrahepatic and post-hepatic, there's obviously a decreased clearance of bilirubin. All right? So these two give you decreased clearance of bilirubin, whereas pre-hepatic has to do with increased production of bilirubin. Okay, this is a fun way to look at this. This is a beautiful comic from midcomic.com. So a big thank you to Mr. Jorge Muniz uh, for use of his illustrations. So pre-hepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic. So pre-hepatic, we said the buzzword here is hemolysis. This could be on the basis of transfusion reactions, sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, autoimmune hemolysis. The list goes on. Hepatic implies something is intrinsically wrong in the liver. Hepatitis, paracellular carcinoma, cirrhosis, congenital disorders, drugs, drugs, and more drugs. And post-hepatic in the way of this is where the surgical causes come in. Gallstones, inflammation, scar tissue, tumors, right? Cholangiocarcinoma, classic in tumor, which block the flow of bile into the intestines. Right, so that's a plumbing problem. Okay. Hey, what's this? I have a joke about the flu, but I hope you don't get it. <laughs> Alrighty. So increased production of bilirubin can be subpartitioned into uh, intravascular hemolysis and extravascular hemolysis, including that which occurs within the reticular endothelial system. Uh, intravascular hemolysis includes a small collection of related disease under the umbrella of what we call microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, otherwise more affectionately termed MAHA, right? Microangiopathic. And this commonly includes things like thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, TTP, and hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS. A much rarer condition called paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, PNH, also leads to intravascular hemolysis. Now, extravascular hemolysis, on the other hand, can be due to an intrinsic red blood cell defect, such as seen in hereditary conditions like lipocytosis, tomatocytosis, ferrocytosis, and the like. Glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, sickle cell disease, and a variety of membrane defects, which is what we alluded to earlier when we said lipocytosis, spherocytosis, etc. Right? Um, extrinsic red blood cell defects includes things like infections. Oh man! Malaria, Plasmodium falciparum, which is endemic to certain parts of South Africa. Babesiosis is another parasite, which is not really endemic to us, more in the, uh, the other tropical areas and, and, and the Northern Hemisphere, right? Um, then we get things like autoimmune hemolytic anemia and then hypersplenism, all righty. So uh, one of the offerings we have on the clinical care platform is the um, workshop on laboratory data analysis. And we actually had that this last Saturday. And this is a beautiful slide taken from that workshop where we looked at the, the different macroangiopathic hemolytic anemia as well, DIC and TTP, and compared them head to head in terms of the variety of tests that we have available to us. Right. And we said that in DIC, essentially, it's a consumptive coagulopathy, right? So your INR is going to be up, your fibrinogen is going to be down, right? Your APTC is going to be up, your platelets are usually invariably down. And the hallmark is that you can have. Um, you know, raised D-dimer, and you're also going to have schistocytes on the smear, which speaks to, um, you know, abnormal, destroyed red blood cells, right? Versus TTP, right, where, yes, your platelets are going to be low, but your INR, your APTT, your fibrinogen, your D-dimer are going to be normal. And we said the TTP has a classic clinical pentad, 
of fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal impairment, and neurological problems. Okay, ICP, ICP usually happens in patients who do not appear to be so sick clinically. Platelets are down, but all the other parameters are normal. So I just threw the slide in here today just to give us a conceptual framework of differentiating DIC versus TTP versus ICP, which uh, you know often does occur in the medical wards. Okay, now moving on to conditions which decrease the clearance of bilirubin, intrahepatic etiologies can be subdivided into defects in transport and conjugation versus intrahepatic cholestasis. Right. So in the first of these two categories are genetic diseases of which we have Gilbert syndrome. Hmm. This is by far the most common. Now, Gilbert syndrome is a benign abnormality caused by a variety of defects affecting the activity of the enzyme responsible for the conjugation of bilirubin. It's typically an incidental finding on routine liver function tests when the unconjugated or indirect bilirubin fraction is mildly elevated. While the remaining liver function tests are normal, that's, that, that's a typical picture, right? Jaundice in patients with Gilbert syndrome may become evident during stress, like during fasting or during periods of illness. Now, in addition to Gilbert syndrome, a common complication of heart failure, yes, cardiac failure, and we call this congestive hepatopathy, can result with the elevation of bilirubin, predominantly unconjugated bilirubin, in which the magnitude of elevation corresponds more to the right atrial pressure than to the actual cardiac output, right? So moving on to the intrahepatic cholestasis category, of course, now the word cholestasis basically means stagnation or impairment of normal bile flow. Now, many conditions can lead to cholestasis within the liver. These include any form of hepatitis. Yes, we're talking to any form of hepatitis, alcoholic, viral, toxin-induced, autoimmune, ischemic, all of that, right? Any form of cirrhosis. Yes, indeed. The distinct diagnosis of PBC, now the nomenclature has changed. It's no longer called primary biliary cirrhosis. It's now called primary biliary cholangitis, right? PBC. Uh, infiltrative diseases such as, yes, lymphoma. We're talking to you, lymphoma. Amyloidosis and TB. And there's a condition called cholestasis of pregnancy. And of course, the use of TPN, which is total parental nutrition. The typical term used for post-hepatic decreased biliary clearance is extrahepatic cholestasis, right? Here we find stones, stones, and more stones, polydocolithiasis, right, which is common bile duct stones, essentially. Infection of the bile ducts, known as cholangitis. Malignancy, mm, specifically cholangiocarcinoma and pancreatic cancer. Watch out, CA, head of pancreas. Strictures, right, including those seen with chronic pancreatitis and Parasitic infections, you've got those nasty ascaris worms which swim up the bile duct and cause cholestatic issues. In addition, there are several conditions with the roughly equal predilection for both intra- and extrahepatic biliary ducts. These are things like liver flukes, right? infections. Um, then we've got primary sterosing uh, cholangitis, PSC, and AIDS cholangiopathy. And finally, are our jaundice Mimics. Jaundice mimics? Yes. This includes anything which turns the skin yellow without an abnormal bilirubin level. And the most notable condition in this class is something we call keratinemia, caused by the prolonged excessive consumption of keratin rich foods, which is vitamin A, right? Such as carrots and sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes, potato, potato, most often seen in young kids and those with hypothyroidism. But this is a beautiful picture. Now look at this, right? This is keratinemia on the left, or keratoderma, if you like. And this is jaundice. So you can see the yellowish discoloration of the palms, but the sclera is normal. That is not jaundice, my friend. That is keratinemia. Person who has yellowish discoloration of the skin and the sclera, yeah, that is jaundice. Okay, so this, these are basically all our etiologies compared head-to-head, uh, -head, right? So within the liver... Uh, let me just find my... Oh, yeah. So the most common causes of acute jaundice, I mentioned here, uh, in, and these have asterisks next to them, right? Gilbert syndrome, alcoholic and viral hepatitis, and polydocolithiasis. That's acute jaundice. And the most common causes of 
chronic kind of progressive grumbling insidious jaundice uh, uh, cirrhosis and uh, pancreatic cancer. Now, notably, this framework leaves out or de-emphasizes causes of jaundice in neonates and infants. So if you are somebody from pediatrics here tonight, I'm so sorry, this framework does not apply to neonates and infants because that deserves its own completely separate framework and discussion, which is out of the scope of this lecture tonight. Okay. Now, did you know that you must go to the foot doctor to get healed? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, now we're moving on to the, um, the clinical approach to jaundice patients. Now, when taking the history of a patient presenting with jaundice, you obviously want to ask about the chronology. When did your jaundice start? How long has it been present? Is it episodic in that it comes and goes, or is it always there, being constant? What associated symptoms do you have? Now, the most relevant to ask specifically about include abdominal pain and abdominal distension, uh, clay-colored stool known as colic stools, which are caused by a lack of bilirubin breakdown products in the stool. Right? Do we have leg edema? Do we have pruritus? Do we have weight gain or weight loss? Is there fever? Components of the past medical history that are particularly relevant include any hematological liver, pancreatic or cardiac disease, as well as HIV. There are many, 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 many medications, supplements, especially herbal products, watch out for your herbal ingestion, which are associated with jaundice, particularly by the mechanism of drug-induced hepatitis. Blame it on the alcohol. Does your patient consume alcohol? If so, how often? What kind of alcohol? Right? What's the percentage of alcohol? Are they consuming beers? or a black label, or are they just doing ciders on the weekends, or are they doing heavy stuff like straw rum, spirits, whiskey, brandy? We want to know what you're drinking, because that tells us about the effect on the liver, right? And um, even IV drugs as well, right? You must inquire about these things. Take a good sexual history, because these are risk factors for both hepatitis B and HIV. And uh, travel history, very important. Have you been to a malaria endemic zone? Right. What about hepatitis A virus, which can also cause jaundice, uh, ascaris, and liver flukes as well? And so it's important to take a good data travel history. So that's your history. Now, moving on to the clinical examination, uh, obviously, you've got to do your vital signs. And then your focused physical examination should include a full, thorough abdominal examination, including an assessment for our beautiful splenomegaly, a cardiac examination. You want to pay attention to that jugular venous pressure. Is it raised? Are we dealing with congestive hepatopathy? An, a, an extremity exam. Here you're looking for edema. And a skin exam, predominantly looking for signs of liver disease. Yes. Is there leukonychia? Is there palmar erythema? Is there Dupuytren's contracture? Are these, uh, is there pruritus? What about the distribution of the body hair? Is there lack of distribution of male pattern body hair? Is there spider angiomata? Testicular atrophy? All these things. The labs for the patient with jaundice includes a full blood count, a basic uh, kind of metabolic panel, liver function test, and of course, an internationalized, uh, an, rather international normalized ratio. If the AST and ALT, the transaminases, if these are elevated, you also probably want to do a viral hepatitis panel, plus or minus a paracetamol level, right? depending on the confirmed chronicity of the jaundice. If unconjugated bilirubin is predominant, also consider a workup, so-called hemolysis bloods, okay, which includes a reticulous eye count, lactate dehydrogenase, haptoglobin, Coombs test, blood smear, particularly if the history is not consistent with uh, Gilbert or Gilbert syndrome. Now, the pattern of results from these blood tests usually fall cleanly into either one of the following four categories. You can either have predominantly increased unconjugated fraction of bilirubin with or without a decreased hemoglobin, or you may have an increase in both conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin combined with a significant increase in the transaminases. You might have an increase in both forms of bilirubin as well as an increase in INR and a decrease in albumin and decreased platelets. And lastly, you may just have a predominantly increased conjugated bilirubin. Now let's go through the next investigative steps for each particular pattern. Right. In the first scenario, right, um, consider whether the patient has a history of recurrent and self-limited jaundice during times of infection, 
or you know during times of stress? If so, yeah, it's probably Gilbert syndrome. An additional workup is usually not necessary. But if no, consider whether there is evidence of hemolytic anemia, such as a low hemoglobin, high reticulocyte count and reticulocyte index. That's provided the bone marrow is functional. High lactate dehydrogenase. Why LDH is high? Because as the red blood cells lies, they liberate LDH into the bloodstream. And you can quantify that by the LDH assay. And you also have a decreased haptoglobin, which supports the diagnosis of hemolysis. So if a sufficient combination of these findings were present, then you say you want to work the patient up for beautiful hemolytic anemia, starting with a peripheral blood smear, looking for schistocytes, and a Coombs test. So the Coombs test is going to tell you whether you're dealing with an autoimmune hemolysis or not, right? If those findings of a hemolytic anemia are not present, consider whether this could be the first presentation of a patient with Gilbert syndrome or an unusual presentation of disease, which is usually associated with the increase in both unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin, right? Now for the second scenario, where both your conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin is up, as well as a marked increase in your transaminase. Right? When this is the case, that is very, very, very suggestive of acute or subacute hepatocellular disease, i.e. hepatitis. Workup here should include viral hepatitis serologies. Now, the Americans call it acetaminophen. We call it paracetamol, right? So paracetamol level, uh, even if the patient denies a history of paracetamol use. Pregnancy test. This is one diagnosis neither you nor the patient can afford to miss. Okay, so pregnancy test. Abdominal, some form of abdominal imaging, usually in the way of a right upper quadrant ultrasound. One can also consider a workup for rare causes of hepatitis, such as autoimmune hepatitis, particularly if the patient is without a recent history of heavy alcohol use. All right now, in the, in the third scenario, where both bilirubins are elevated, but the other, probably more prominent abnormality is a high INR, a low albumin, and decreased platelets. Now, this speaks very loudly to cirrhosis. Okay? Now, in the patient whose cirrhosis is severe enough to be causing jaundice, there are almost always other physical findings consistent with the diagnosis that are clinically observable, such as ascites lower extremity edema, spira angiomata, palmar erythema, and acidixis, among many others. Additional diagnostic testing should also include hepatitis serologies and an iron panel. Why are we doing an iron panel? For hemochromatosis. Abdominal imaging, in which the right upper quadrant ultrasound is once again usually sufficient. And as with hepatitis, consider a workup for other rare causes of cirrhosis. So I remember an acronym for cirrhosis. So the A stands for autoimmune hepatitis or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The B stands for hepatitis B or bud Chiari syndrome. The C stands for hep C or copper overload, speaks to Wilson's disease. D speaks to drugs. E speaks to ethanol. And F stands for either fatty liver disease or F for iron, you know, F-E-I-N. And that speaks to hemochromatosis. Right? And among the, the last possible scenario, where the most striking abnormality is elevated conjugated bilirubin and an elevated alkphos, which is a cholestatic enzyme. That's indicative of a probable biliary obstruction, which in Western countries is most often the consequence of malignancy. So therefore, the test of choice here is going to be some form of abdominal imaging. The specific choice of which imaging modality you use is going to depend on where you work, right? Uh, including the number of factors relating to costs uh, and availability. And of course, what specific diagnoses are near the top of your differential. For example, uh, where I practice, um, ultrasounds are probably a little bit more available than CT scans, right? So the most likely diagnosis of the patient with the combination of, or this particular combination of lab tests, if you're thinking about pancreatic cancer, it's probably better visualized by a CT versus something like gallstones, which would be probably better to get via ultrasound. Okay. So it all depends on what you have available and what your foremost uh, differential diagnosis is, okay? Um, however, uh, if the diagnosis is still unclear after you do your CTO and your ultrasound, then you might want to consider either ERCP or an MRCP. So ERCP stands for endoscopic retrograde glangiopancreatography, and MRCP stands for magnetic resonance glangiopancreatography, which best visualizes the ability tree. Obviously, ERCP has the added advantage of you being able to intervene via the actual procedure. So if there's a polydocolithiasis, for instance, you'll be able to go and extract that bile, uh, that stone from the bile duct. Or if you're suspecting cholangiocarcinoma, you can do 
uh, brushings and do cytology uh, via the ERCP versus MRCP, which is purely just for visualization of the bloody system. All right. So why did the doctor laugh at the X-ray of the arm? Because he found the X-ray humorous. Uh, and actually, you ever wondered why the elbow is called the funny bone? Because it's attached to the humerus. Yeah. All right, so this is also one of the slides taken from our recent lab analysis workshop. So this is talking not to jaundice. This is speaking specifically to an abnormality in your liver function test, right? Most, not particularly jaundice, but just any abnormality in your liver function. So there's something we call the R value. And the R value is calculated by taking your serum ALT, dividing that by the upper limit of the ALT, and all that divided by the ALK force divided by the upper limit of the ALK force, right? But if your R value falls within a specific category, that speaks to the kind of liver disease your patient has. So if your R value is above five, that's hepatocellular. If your R value is below two, that's cholestatic. But if your R value falls between two and five, that's a mixed picture. And of course, this beautiful slide gives us the further investigations and modalities that you want to do based on your R value. So if you're looking at a hepatocellular, picture with an R value above 5, then you probably want to do your hepatitis serologies, hep C, RNA, autoimmune hepatitis serology, some kind of imaging. That's first line. Second line, you probably want to think about other more rare causes, right? If you're dealing with a cholestatic picture, meaning your R value is below 2, first line is imaging, imaging, imaging. Not so much hepatitis serology, but more imaging. And you've got second line tests being ER or MRCP. But if you're dealing with a mixed picture, then you probably want to incorporate features from both of these other categories, right? So I just threw that in there. Uh, all right, coming back to our clinical case. We still got our 41-year-old lady who's waiting for us patiently in the clinic, right? Just a quick recap. She came in with jaundice. She has pruritus, dark urine. She has nice fever, abdominal pain, weight loss. Uh, she has yellowish skin. Uh, LFT shows uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia with a raised outcross and some mild elevation of the transaminases. CT was normal. Ultrasound shows normal gallbladder, but could not see the common bile duct. What is the next management step? The answer is, drum roll, please. <laughs> Endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. ERCP is the way to go. Why is that the answer? This is the cholestatic picture, right? She's got deep jaundice. She's got raised arc force. She's got a raised conjugated fraction of bilirubin. Now, painless jaundice always requires extensive workup because the pathologies are ominous. So, so here we're looking mainly at malignancies, CA head of pancreas, classkin tumor, and so forth. Early detection and intervention are absolutely crucial. Right? The gallbladder showed no evidence of stones. There was no clinical evidence of polycystitis. And we know the signs of polycystitis. Does she have a Murphy sign? No, she didn't have a Murphy sign. We said abdominal examination was normal. There was no elevation. Well, it's not elevation in the transaminases, but hepatitis is unlikely. Uh, primary bilirubin cholangitis is a consideration, but PBC is more common in women. And um, the lack of obvious lesion on CT doesn't rule out cholestasis in the bilirubin tree. Uh, like we said, doesn't rule out cholangiocarcinoma and PSC. ERCP, as we said, is both diagnostic and therapeutic. Okay, so the answer here, everybody, is ERCP. Okay, I just talk a little bit about the diploma program in internal medicine that we at the clinical care platform are passionate about teaching. So if you love internal medicine and you're probably looking to further yourself uh, to, to improve your, your acumen, to improve your CV, if you're heading in, if you want to join the registrarship program and you want to beef up your CV, or if you just want to improve your general management of medical patients, this is um, just the schedule that we had for the, the program that was done earlier in the year. So we dedicate um, the different sections based on the weighting as per the exam pro forma or blueprints, right? So, as you can see, cardiology, endocrine, HIV, TB, infectious disease, kidneys, and talk a bit about the therapeutics, about the lungs, rheumatology, gastroenterology, geriatrics and nutrition, neurology, emergency medicine, hematology, oncology, ethics, and then we had a specific section on OSCE preparation, right? So um, you're also going to be including workshops, so ECG and the chest X-ray interpretation masterclasses are included in this particular package, right? A little bit about the lab analysis workshop. This is what you can get from this one. This is another masterclass that we offer. We looked at hematology and a whole spectrum of hematological lab-based disorders, then non-hematology, looking at the blood gas analysis, thyroid function, liver function, UNEs, inflammatory markers, urinalysis, you name it, you name it, it was there, right? And this is just one of the examples of the slides where we went through the common causes of liver function, chest abnormalities, just to give you a, 
a bird's eye view of how the slides are arranged and the kind of information you can get. This is a summary of TFT interpretation in the context of a TSH and a free T43 and the variety of differentials that you can have. Because I know that TFT interpretation can be a challenge in specific contexts. We looked at, and this is an example of an algorithm for ordering TFTs. Uh, then, of course, we have the workshop on mechanical ventilation, where we address these particular topics. Uh, there's a whole lot of information from non-invasive to invasive, looking at vent modes, how to set the vent, pathological, physical, physiological complications. This is an example of a capnography that we, we went through. And uh, just an overview of vent modes. So we take you through volume control, pressure control, PRVC, and we describe these in detail. This is the same information in a different kind of uh, slide. And of course, we also offer the ECG masterclass where we take you from knowing the very basics to being confident in ECG interpretation. And this is a bird's eye view of the topics we offer here. And this is just an example of the different vascular territories in the context of uh, uh, myocardial infarct. And then, of course, the chest X-ray masterclass where we look at a systematic approach to chest X-ray interpretation. Yes, we look at different sections, assessment of the quality, we look at the cardiac silhouette, we look at the lungs, diffuse and focal processes, look at assessment for lines, tubes, devices. This is an example of one of the slides from that particular talk, looking at the cardiac silhouette and the mediastinum. And lastly, if you love internal medicine, I encourage you to go have a look at YouTube. I have a, a YouTube channel where I have more than 400 videos. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that you will enjoy. Okay, Dr. Moela, we're almost there. So your doggy bag of takeaway points for jaundice. Jaundice is yellowish discoloration of the skin, eyes, and mucous membranes caused by elevation in serum bilirubin. There are two primary forms of bilirubin, conjugated, that is called indirect, and uh, rather unconjugated, which is indirect, and conjugated, which is direct. The primary etiologies of an isolated increase in unconjugated fraction are hemolysis from any cause and Gilbert syndrome, which is a common enzyme defect without any significant clinical sequelae. The primary etiology of increased conjugated bilirubin can be classified as either intrahepatic or post-hepatic, and new onset jaundice in the adult without other symptoms should prompt investigation for pancreatic or biliary malignancy. Thank you so much for your attention, everybody. Here are my references. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sue Pesat. I think this was, uh, you know, awesome. Um, I really enjoy uh, this session, and I think personally, I'm quite uh, getting more and more, you know, empowered. You know, we do a lot of uh, mortality reviews, and some of the cases when we review them, you know, I generally use uh, some of these frameworks uh, that you have. You know, even this week, you know, in the in the lab interpretation masterclass, you had a slide on hypercalcemia. I can yes. tell you that bonus slide, I used it this week and I was able to empower colleagues, you know. So uh, don't ever take uh, the work you do for granted. There's many, 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 many patients and the clinicians who really benefit uh, from this session. So colleagues, yeah, I hope you feel the same way um, that I do. Um, and I'd, re I'd really love to encourage you to invite more, more, more people to come and attend because, uh, you know, some common things, we I don't know, like anemia, you know, we leave it there. You know, just say the patient has anemia, but this framework teaches that, no, you can't just say anemia, you have to, look for the underlying cause, use the algorithms and get to the bottom of the issue and not just transfuse the patient every month without really picking up what the issues are. So really, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Swepesat. Um, we we really appreciate that. Okay, so um, Ryan, maybe let me start with my question. I saw there on your framework where we use the R uh, sort of um, calculation, you have the most obvious one on, on the hepatitis side, the cholestatic side, but the mixed. Um, are there yes. are there particular common conditions that may present from the start with a mixed picture, or it represents maybe someone who had a hepatocellular condition that maybe has been there for a while and now it's just mixed? I mean, what's your experience about uh, someone who's got a mixed sort of picture? Yeah. Thank you for that. So, so in my experience, you know, if you look at hepatitis, right? So in the liver, you get the hepatocytes, you get the portal triads. Then you also got the tiny biliary canaliculi. 
which which kind of percolates between the the, the hepatocytes. So sometimes hepatitis doesn't stick specifically to the hepatocytes. Yeah, it can also in, in, you know, cause interstitial so-called inflammation as well. So some small degree of cholestasis is so in my experience. When I see this kind of mixed picture, usually it's hepatitis. It's hepatitis running amok in the liver and it's causing a, a mixed kind of picture. The other consideration for that is an infiltrative sort of picture. Now, I don't personally like the word infiltrative, right? But when you see this mixed kind of picture where a little bit of cholestasis, a little bit of transaminitis, you must think of infiltrative conditions, right? So TB can behave like that, TB of the liver and sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis mm. also likes to infiltrate and cause problems, right? Uh, and less commonly, hemochromatosis. But in most instances, it's, it's probably hepatitis in there. Yeah, from my experience. Super, super. Someone has, uh, I don't know if you know much about manganese toxicity or exposure. And there's a question about whether that also causes jaundice. And uh, do, what? how would you approach uh, such a patient? It's in the Q&A chat. Is yeah. that in there? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Zimri, uh, mm. no, I, I have to pass on that one. Uh, maybe I can do some reading and get back to you. I haven't seen manganese toxicity, to be honest. So yeah, out of depth with that one. It's not very, very common. Yeah. Um, Ryan, I wanted to ask you, on your liver function uh, profile, uh, you have your AST, ALT, ALP, GGT, LDH. I think you have, you have taken us through. Is there a specific one which is the most sensitive uh, in the context of alcohol use or toxicity? Or Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful question. I love it. Thank you. Actually, yeah. I should have mentioned that. Thank you. So there's two, there's two things which guide you in terms of alcoholic hepatitis. The first one is the ratio of the AST to the ALT is yeah. going to be greater than two. right? So the AST mm -hmm. is probably going to be double the ALT. Mm -hmm. right? That's the yeah. first one. And the second one is your gamma glutamyl transferase. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have an isolated increase in your gamma GT, right? Mm -hmm. So those two, in a, in a history of a patient who has had alcohol consumption, you know, mm -hmm. adds weight to a diagnosis of alcoholic liver disease. And of course, mm -hmm. clinically, you're going to have certain signs of chronic alcoholism. You have the two patrons contracture, the paratidomegaly, the rubero sign. Uh, together with, if the patient has cirrhosis, you're going to have all the cirrhotic physical signs as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was about to ask you how much alcohol is too much alcohol, but because it's Pusa Thursday, maybe we should leave it at that. <laughs> Look at Michelle's <laughs> question on top. <laughs> so while we're talking about that, you know that there's, there's a new meaning behind HIV? Uh -huh. It's called heavy into vodka. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Michelle is asking uh, the first, first question on top. Uh, is GGT relevant in adults? Because in children where ALP may reflect the uh, bone growth uh, linked to, to growth spreads from bone, Okay, I read that question carefully, but I had a different, it's related to this, because I wanted to ask you, when the ALP is high, when would you say this is due to hepatic versus extra extra hepatic uh, sort of uh, source for ALP? But I think Michelle's question is linked to, to that question, which I had written down. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. you know, in, 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 um, in the Western world, they mm -hmm. have fractionation of ACFOS. Because, you know, mm -hmm. ACFOS can come from various sites, from the liver, from the bone, from the placenta. Uh, mm -hmm. But we don't have the luxury of fractionating it. So you must mm -hmm. interpret the ACFOS in line with the gamma GT. If the mm -hmm. ACFOS and the gamma GT are both raised, that speaks to a cholestatic picture. But if mm -hmm. the ACFOS is up and the gamma GT is normal, then mm -hmm. that probably means that that ACFOS is not coming from the liver. That ACFOS mm -hmm. is coming from elsewhere. And in us, in our demographic, the number one place is bone. So if yeah. you're looking at, depending on the demographic of your patient, a youngster coming in there, teenager, growth spurt, yeah, definitely, it's a growth spurt causing it. But if you're looking at an older patient with a raised alcohol, boom, you must think of metastatic disease to the bone, which is charming the bone and liberating that alcohol, right? And, and, and um, so we must interpret the alcohol in line with the gamma GT and in line with the patient presentation. Another cause of high alcohol is something we call Paget's disease. So uh, Paget's, you know, basically where there's also a degree of destruction of bone. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I hope that answers that question. 
No, no, that's uh, that's very, very, very um, awesome. And then, uh, you know, in the lab interpretation uh, workshop, you took us through urine analysis. And one of the things we are looking at there is bilirubin in, in urine. Can, can you talk about when would you do it and what is the relationship between the talk today and the urine analysis in the context of bilirubin? I think that's what uh, Timothea Constable is asking at 1916. Yeah. So you know that conjugated bilirubin is water soluble, right? So mm. if you can define bilirubin on the dipstick, that probably means it's a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And mm. what you probably is looking at is some kind of cholestatic problem, right? Mm. So it could be stones, worms, tumor, that kind of thing. Versus mm. prehepatic jaundice, which is hemolysis causes unconjugated uh, mm. hyperbilirubinemia, and that will elevate your urobilin. So if mm -hmm. your urobilin, if you have that available on your dipstick, and that speaks to, uh, you know, unconjugated. But more often than not, if you see bilirubin in the urine, it's direct, it's conjugated, and it's a cholestatic mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. 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 And if it's conjugated, it's either post-hepatic or intrahepatic. Intra oh, it could be intrahepatic. Yeah. But mostly, so, mostly post-hepatic. Yeah. All right, I'm following. You see, these things I'm asking, I'm telling you, they help me so much when we evaluate cases. I'm not a physician, but at least I can make one or two comments. <laughs> you are a physician, brother. You are. <laughs> All right, before we continue with the questions, uh, there's a number of questions uh, that came through around the the, the diplomas. Uh, firstly, someone was asking about the fee. So just to remind you that these uh, programs last up to three months, so they are they are quite in, in, intense. Uh, we we are committed to do them, and you also have to be committed um, to 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 do them. It costs five thousand rands for the three months coaching uh, program. For our active members, you are eligible for a 10% um, discount. That is almost 500 rands back um, um, to you. And there was a question about the HIV diploma, whether you can use it to apply for the higher diploma in sexual health. Um, I, I'm not able to say yes. And uh, we are really working hard to you know, improve our collaboration with the College of Medicine. We have had several very positive meeting. So we, I want to invite them actually to come and give us a brief about the different diplomas so that you are in a position to ask specific questions and, and get a lot of clarity. So I'm hoping that in the next couple of weeks, we will start to to, to announce um, that type of um, collaboration. Um, Mwipon is asking about, um, in terms of liver enzyme derangements, what do they look like in drug-induced liver injury? And I, I had written down a specific question to say, again, from your liver test, which enzymes are the most... Remember with alcohol, you said AST, um, most sensitive. So with the drug-induced liver injury, um, are there specific enzymes that are most sensitive um, as you look at your LFT results, yeah, yeah, beautiful. Because okay, guys, when it comes to drugs and the liver, right? So mm. there's two, there's two big categories. So you, mm. one which is idiosyncratic. Idiosyncratic means there's no established relationship; it just mm. happens. And then there's mm. dose related, right? So there's mm. dose related, and then there's idiosyncratic. But in the context specifically of anti-tuberculous treatment, because I think that's a big talking point. Mm. Um, so the guidelines say, let's say, you can correct me if I'm mistaken. So if your total bilirubin is above 35 micromol per liter, or if your transaminases are above three to five times the upper limit of normal, mm -hmm. then we consider that to be the definition of drug-induced liver injury. So also mm -hmm. you've got to consider the context of which specific drug. Like rifampicin can cause predominantly cholestatic liver injury versus mm -hmm. something like uh, pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide causes predominantly uh, hepatocellular liver injury. Right? And I think the same process applies to other drugs which commonly cause liver issues, like your statins and your antibiotics, right? and some anti-epileptics and some cytotoxic drugs. It depends on the individual mechanism. Some of them are dose-related, some of them are idiosyncratic. Paracetamol is a bad guy, uh, especially in overdose. Right? We all know that. right? And when we, when, do, when we did the diploma program, we'll talk about that RUMAC normogram and how to plot the patient based on the time after presentation. They often come mm -hmm. in with liver failure, massive increase in their transaminases. Trans mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it just depends on the specific kind of drug. Uh, but watch out for your AST, ALT, and total bilirubin in terms of anti-tuberculous uh, treatment. 
Hmm. It's very interesting because I, I have a follow-up question. You know, sometimes when we evaluate, especially in, in TB, you'll find that people get stuck because sometimes you have a patient maybe who's jaundiced, right? But when you look at the liver function test, you could either get two things. You could get a very high ALT, uh, which maybe then need, needs to push you to think a little bit differently. Sometimes you get very high ALPs and GGTs, and then uh, you need to think differently. But general clinicians will just say everything is drug-induced toxicity. Now, I needed you to explain how a, an infiltrative uh, disease or disorder may, may does it how does it present on your on your LS? Because sometimes when I look at this, I'm thinking, no, this thing is infiltrative, and TB may may cause that. It's not necessarily like the drug itself. So, how do you interface between a, a patient who's presenting? Is this a drug toxicity? Is this an infiltrative uh, disorder from the same disease? The disease versus the drugs used to treat the disease, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Hey, let's say, you know, this term infiltrative, you won't find it in all the textbooks. Because yeah. some of the hypatologists are not fans of infiltrative. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. So, what infiltrative means is your alk and your gamma GT are elevated, but yeah. your bilirubin is not elevated. So, okay. there's some degree of cholestasis, but it's not enough to push your bilirubin up. So, okay. in that context, normally we see patients with the intra abdominal lymphadenopathy mm. and TB abdomen. You know, when you see that kind of picture, you said, Let's yeah. ultrasound the abdomen and look for splenic microaphthesis, uh, intra-abdominal granulomas, intra-abdominal lymphadenopathy. And that usually mm -hmm. leads you to the diagnosis of TB abdomen. But of course, lymphoma is a big differential for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that's what they mean with infiltrator. Yeah. So you prefer use cholestatic? Yeah, the hepatologist will say, no, that's have, still cholestatic. That's TB, still cholestatic. TB granulomas that have spread to, to the liver. In terms of this framework on the slide, it will be more on the cholestatic side, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, I think I like the part where you spoke about um, whether they have high bilis or not. Can you explain that again? That's for my knowledge, please. Sure, sure. So when they say infiltrative, they're implying that the bilirubin is normal but the alk force and the gamma GT are high. So okay. there's some degree of cholestasis, but it's probably intrahepatic cholestasis, which is not pushing the bilirubin up too much. And mm -hmm. it's in that context that we say infiltrative, and we do an ultrasound and we find features in keeping with TB, abdomen or lymphoma, and mm -hmm. you know we chase that up accordingly. And then if the bilirubin is also up, that you wouldn't say it's, it's from t t something like TB? It could be. It all depends on what your ultrasound finds. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Super. Yeah. And I also like that because for me, when I look at this framework to the left, where it says hepatocellular, you are mostly looking for sort of medical type of things, you know? And then to the right, cholestatic, you might be looking at some growth, some mass, or something like that. But as we have said, it depends on how far the patient has had those conditions. You might end up with a mixed picture. Or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, but I think I'm empowered on the liver. Colleagues, you can contact me for any liver derangement. <laughs> yes, you will deliver. I think I've, I've, I've yeah, I think I've, I've, I've managed to grasp something positive today. All right, all right, all right, all right. Super. So there's a question. Can I, yes? can I, can I tell you something about calcium? You mentioned hypercalcemia. Okay. So did you hear that, that calcium recently was fired from the bank? You know why? Uh -huh. Because he could only he could only deposit. <laughs> That's what Garziab does. <laughs> all right. So I think we have answered all the key questions. Now, Andrew, now we can answer your question. Because sometimes when we have a lot of questions, we tend to prioritize the ones that are really strongly linked to the topic. So you are asking about a urine lamb test. And why should the CD4 count be less than 200 first before you do the procedure? Uh, I have a lot to say. <laughs> uh, okay. This one's for you, brother. This one's for you. Yeah, yeah I'll, just, I'll just say that it's it's from science. So we always follow science. If you look at the studies, um, urine lambs, generally, most TB diagnostic tests have a very low um, sensitivity. You know, the urine lamb, I think... 
if you do it in patients who are very immune competent and are still, you know, in good shape, you'll find that the sensitivities are very low, 20 to 30 percent. And you're going to find it very difficult to interpret the test. You know, when it's negative, is it truly negative? You know, things like that. Now, this urine lamb test is based on a specific uh, polysaccharide um, that you find on the membrane of the TB bacilli. So as the bacilli replicates, it then releases, you know, uh, this polysaccharide, which then you would find in urine, right? Now, why do you find it in urine? It's because in patients who have advanced HIV disease. Now, this advanced HIV disease is what? It is patients who have a low CD4 count, less than 200, or WHO stage 3, stage 4. This group of patients, their kidneys become more permeable. You know, So patients who are immune competent and, and, and healthy, even when they have TB, you won't find uh, uh, um, this polysaccharide um, in urine, right? So, so to improve the sensitivity and the effectiveness of the test, you have to do it in patients where if they do have TB, you are most likely to, to get it uh, in urine. Hence, it is not a test to confirm that this is disseminated TB. So finding it in urine doesn't mean that it is disseminated TB, but it means that um, there's TB somewhere in the body, and uh, they are, they are, their kidneys are now able to pass this polysaccharide. Um, and the passing of this polysaccharide in urine is associated with how bad is, is the immune system uh, for, for the patient. So that's how I can explain it. Uh, but the, we discuss it in detail, colleagues, uh, as you come to the HIV Diploma Preparatory Program. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. We will take you through everything about it. All right, um, Ryan and colleagues, thank you very much again for joining us this evening. This was an awesome one. I really enjoyed uh, this uh, 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 topic today amongst the, the many. Um, can you remind us of your take home message, uh, Brother Ryan? I think we are we are we are done for for the night. Thank you very much. It's all appreciated. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Mavila. I appreciate you. And thank you, everybody. Uh, th th these are basically my my knockout points. Your takeaway <laughs> doggy bag for the evening. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and all I got to say is uh, thank you so much for joining us, and looking forward to seeing you in the future. And uh, don't forget, if you love internal medicine, and if yep. you love everything we offer on the clinical care platform, you are welcome to join our master classes, our diploma prepar preparation programs, and uh, looking forward to seeing you in other platforms as well. Thank you. Super, super. Colleagues, may I wish you a great night. If you are not a member of the platform, join um, 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 the membership. I've just shared the link. May you have a peaceful one with your families. Thank you, Dr. Swipesat. Thank you, brother.